The new Unity input system has been around for a while now. There are plenty of tutorials on how to use it, and I've watched some of them to learn the basics, but I wanted to learn more so that I can use the input system without relying on the tutorials to tell me what to do. I started reading through the documentation and learned a lot about the input system, so I decided to make this video to share what I learned and hopefully help some of you. I should mention that I haven't used the old input manager much, so I don't know a lot about it, but from what I understand, the new input system is a huge improvement. It helps to keep your code clean, and it seems to make a lot of things much easier. I don't intend for this to be a typical step-by-step -step tutorial. Instead, I want to provide as much information as I can to help you use the input system effectively for any project. I'm going to run through short examples throughout the video to show how some of the things are done. And I'll be sure to include plenty of timestamps in the description for anybody who wants to jump to a specific topic. The input system is installed through the package manager, just like all other tools and assets in Unity. To open the package manager, we'll go up to the menu bar, click Window, and then click Package Manager. In this drop-down menu, select All Packages. Sometimes this option will just say All, and sometimes it says Unity Registry. Now you can either look for the input system in all these packages on the left, or use the search bar. Once you find the input system, Click the Install button in the bottom right, and Unity will import the package. You will see this warning pop up that says the project settings need to be changed. Go ahead and hit Yes, and Unity will restart. If you ever need to change that setting manually, go to Edit, Project Settings, Player, and then under Other Settings, scroll down until you find Configuration, and at the very bottom you'll find Active Input Handling. We want to select the Input System Package. If you need to be able to use the old Input Manager as well, you can select both. Back in the Package Manager, I also want to point out all of the samples that you can import into the project. These are just example scenes that show you how to do quite a few different things with the Input System. The simple demo has a few different scenes that show you several different ways to handle input. The documentation shows how you can get input by reading the state on input devices. This is similar to how you would handle input with the old input manager, so it kind of defeats the purpose of using the new input system, but it can be useful for quick tests and prototypes. The input system has quite a few different built-in input devices, which make it easier to use. All of the input devices that are built into Unity are listed on this page, and then some of these are just categories that contain more options. For example, a mouse is a type of pointer. The sensors section contains quite a few options for phones, too. It's even possible to create your own input device if you want to. Let's look at a quick example of how you can read states directly from an input device. I set this scene up ahead of time to speed things up a little bit. The first thing I want to do is make sure I include the input system. Then I want to access an input device. So I'll say what kind of input device I want to use, and then I'll give it a name. Now in the start method, I'll get a reference to the current keyboard. Since this is in the start method, if for some reason the keyboard wasn't plugged in when I started the game, it wouldn't be able to find one if I plugged it in afterwards. You can move this line to the update method if you want to avoid that problem. Now I'm just going to make a list to hold some of the UI elements that I made. Before trying to read from an input device, you want to make sure that you don't have a null reference. Now I want to check if the W key is pressed, and when it's pressed, I want to activate the button, and when it's not pressed, I'll deactivate it. Now I'll just put the script on the canvas and add a reference to all the UI buttons. Now, whenever the W key is down, the display on the UI should light up. Now I'll just do the same thing for the other keys, and we can see that each one will light up when the corresponding key is pressed. 
Instead of is pressed, you can use was pressed this frame, which is only true during the frame that the button was pressed. This is useful if you only want to trigger something once when a button is pressed. I'm going to add a log statement to make this easier to see. Now let's get a controller connected. Keep in mind that you can access any input device the same way. Since a controller has some analog inputs, we can read some of them a little differently than we could from a keyboard. Using the read value method on the trigger, I can read a float value that represents how much the trigger is pressed, rather than just the state of a key. I can also read the value from the sticks on the controller, but rather than a float, they return a 2D vector that shows the position of the stick. I can get a similar effect from the keys on the keyboard by making a makeshift composite control. I would define a composite control as a combination of the values from multiple inputs. In this case I'm going to use the four buttons to create a 2D vector. And I say it's a makeshift composite control because the input system actually has a way to create composites. I just wanted to use this as a simple example of what they are. Like I already said, Getting inputs this way basically ignores all of the cool features of the input system, so let's start talking about what makes the input system so special. Input actions are a major part of the input system. And the documentation says, input actions are designed to separate the logical meaning of an input from the physical means of input that generate the input. And that's a bit of a confusing definition, so I would rephrase it as Input actions are meant to separate the physical action that a player performs to generate an input, like pressing a button, from what that input means in the context of the game, which could be something like jumping. The actions act like a middleman that provide information on the inputs to your game code. The action editor is probably the easiest way to make actions, and to get to it, you just right click in the project panel, then create a new input actions give it a name, then double click it to open it. So what we just created is called an input action asset, which is basically just a container for all of the action maps in a project. Now an action map is a collection of actions, and you usually create an action map for any group of controls that will all be enabled at the same time. For example, you may have a gameplay action map that contains actions for player movement, jumping, and attacking. These are all things that should be enabled during gameplay, but you can also have an action map for the UI, and these actions would let you navigate the menus. Having these in separate action maps is useful because you can enable one and disable the other, so you can avoid situations where your character is running around in the background while you're trying to navigate menus. I've already explained actions a bit, but to give another definition, an action is a high-level or logical input, like jump or fire, that your game code understands. That way it doesn't rely on any specific input device or control. This means that the bindings can be changed on an action without requiring any changes to the game code. A binding is just a physical button that triggers an action, and each action can have several different bindings assigned to it. I'm going to walk through creating an action map with a few different actions in it that I can use in some examples later. I'll create an action map first, and when I do that it automatically adds the first action. I'm going to turn this action into the fire action. Each action has a binding added by default. For the fire action, all I need to do is select the button I want to use. So I'll select the binding, and then over here in the drop-down menu next to path, 
I'll click the listen button and press whatever button I want to use. You also have the option of searching through the menus to find the button you're looking for. For the move action, I want to use something different than this default binding. More specifically, I want to use a 2D vector composite. This is similar to what I did earlier when I was pulling input devices. There's a couple different ways to add a composite. I can either just right click on the action and select add a new 2D vector composite, or I can go and change the action type to value, then change the control type to 2D vector. Now when I click the plus button next to the action, I can add a 2D vector composite. Composites are used to process input values to make them imitate the type of value that the action is expecting. In this case, I want a 2D vector, so I'm taking the value from four different buttons, the W, A, S, and D keys, and using them to create a vector. With the input system, you can also create a custom composite, but I'm not going to cover that in this video. I'll leave a link to the documentation in the description, and there's also a sample in the package manager that explains how to do it if you're interested. I also need to add the control for looking around in the scene. I'll use the change in the mouse position to do this. Responding to actions can be made much easier later when you use the correct action and control types. The control type just changes the type of value that the action passes to your game code. It also limits the possible bindings you can select. If the control type is a button and I go look at the possible bindings for a gamepad, you'll notice that the only controls that show up are those that act like a button. This is basically anything but the sticks on the controller. It's easier to see if I change the control type to a 2D vector. Now the only bindings available will be the sticks and the D-pad, since they're the only controls that are set up to return a 2D vector by default. The action type influences how state changes for an action are processed. The button action type will only let you bind button type controls like we just saw when changing the control type. This type of action also doesn't check the initial state, since it only needs to know when the button is pressed. It's best for any actions that trigger once every time an input is pressed. The value action type is more general. It continuously tracks changes to the state of an action and isn't limited to any specific type of control. However, you do have to select the control type. An action of this type will monitor all the controls that are bound to it, but only provides the value from what's called the driving control. If an action has multiple controls bound to it, the driving control is the most actuated control at any time. The process of selecting the driving control is called disambiguation, and this type of action is useful when you want to use multiple controls but only care about the value from one. The pass-through action type is just like the value type, but it skips over the disambiguation process, so any change to any bound control will trigger the action and provide the value of whichever control was changed. In the properties panel, we can also see the interactions and the processors. I'll talk about the interactions later, because there's some other topics I want to cover first. Processors just perform various operations on the input value before passing it on to your code. One last thing I want to mention in here is that you can create control schemes. A control scheme gives you another way of selecting which controls are being used at any given time. A common use for this is to separate keyboard and mouse controls from the controller. So you would have one scheme for the keyboard and mouse and then another scheme for the controller. If you're using control schemes, you need to be sure to add a requirement to the list or else it never gets enabled. For keyboard and mouse, you have to be sure you include both the keyboard and the mouse in the requirements, so both of these are enabled. Then for each binding, you can go through and select which scheme it's a part of. One more thing for the action editor is you need to make sure you save the changes. You can either turn on the autosave setting in the top right, or if that's disabled, you can click the Save Asset button to the left. Another way of creating actions is by embedding them directly in a mono behavior. You can even embed an entire action map if you want. Anytime you use the input system in a script, you should be sure to include unityengine.inputsystem.
Now we can easily create a couple of actions, and these will add an editor directly in the inspector for the game object that this script is attached to. And you can modify these actions just like you would in the action editor. It's just as easy to add an action map that lets you add any actions you want in the inspector. or you could create the actions from scratch in code. Again, I'll be sure to include the input system first, and now I'll create an input action using new input action. I'll pass the name of the action as the first argument, and you can change anything you want about the action using the arguments. So let's add a binding by specifying the control path. You can even still do composite bindings in this, it just gets a little bit messy in my opinion. Creating an action map is similar, we just have to give it a name, and then we can use add action to create every new action we want on the map. If you have multiple maps, you can create an action asset that holds them all, and creating the asset is a little bit different, but it's still pretty easy to do. And then using add action map, we can add any existing action map to the asset. Keep in mind that if you create any actions in code, you have to make sure to enable them before you can use them. You can either enable entire action map or each action individually. Before I talk about how you respond to input actions, I want to talk a little bit more about how they work. Input actions themselves aren't a response to an input. Instead, they just provide information to your game code that you can use to create a response. The information is received in the form of a callback context, which is a class that holds not only the value of the input, but different information on the action itself. One of the things that you can get from the callback context is the phase of the action. Actions have five different phases that can tell you about the input, starting with the disabled phase, which just means the action can't receive any input and it won't switch from this phase until it gets enabled. Once it's enabled, it'll go into the waiting phase, which means it's enabled and it's waiting for any input. The other three phases are started, performed, and canceled. These phases depend on the action type. For the button and value action types, if the action is enabled, when a bound control is actuated, the phase goes from waiting to started, then immediately changes to performed and back to started. The action stays in started as long as the control stays actuated, and goes back to the performed phase whenever the value changes. When the control is released, the action finally goes into the cancelled phase, and then back to waiting. I set up a button to log the phase every time it changes, so we can look at how this works. I show the disabled and waiting phase at the beginning, but neither of these phases actually trigger a response. When I press the button down, the phase will go to started, then immediately to performed, and back to started. And you would expect to see started show up twice, but the action only triggers a response the first time. When I release the button, the cancelled phase finally shows up. I also have it set up to use the trigger on a controller. It gives a similar response, except every time I change the value of the input without releasing it, 
we see the performed phase again. The action only goes to cancelled once the control is completely released. Pass through actions are much simpler. They just stay in the waiting phase and go to performed every time the value changes. The easiest way to respond to actions is probably by adding a player input component to some game object. But there's quite a few settings to it. The first thing you need to set is which input action asset you want to use. And if you haven't already made one, it provides a button to do that. I'll use the actions that I created earlier using the action editor. The next option is the default scheme. This just tells the game which control scheme to try first, and if the chosen control scheme isn't available, the player input will try the other available control schemes. The auto switch setting determines whether the player is allowed to automatically switch control schemes or not. If this setting is off, it's still possible to switch control schemes through the player input API. The default map is similar to the default control scheme, it just decides which action map is enabled by default. If you don't select a map here, no actions are enabled, and you'll have to enable them somewhere in your code. And you can always enable or disable any actions you want through code. All I know about the UI input module is that it handles integration between the input system and the UI system. I haven't messed with it too much, so if you have any information about it, leave it in the comments. The camera provides a reference to the player's view camera, but from my understanding you only need to use this for split-screen setups. The behavior setting tells the player input component how to notify the game code when something related to the player occurs. Most people use the invoke unity events option, so I'll start with that. This allows us to create methods for each action and then map that action to the method through the inspector. The invoke C sharp events behavior is similar, but you won't be able to configure it in the inspector. All of the methods we create need to accept a callback context argument. Like I said earlier, the callback context holds all of the information about an action, like the current phase and the value of the input. I'll start by implementing the fire behavior. Now I want it to fire a projectile every time the button is pressed, so I'll create an onFire method that accepts a callback context instantiate a projectile, and apply a force to it. I'm going to use the main camera as a player, so I'll add the script directly to the camera. Back in the player input component, I'll expand the events, and then the gameplay map. Again, each action is expecting a method that accepts a callback context, so I'll drag the camera into the object box, and then find the method I just created. Now when I hit play, every time I hit the spacebar, it'll fire a projectile, or two, and then when I release the spacebar, it fires another one. That's because the onFire method is getting called every time the phase of the action changes. I'll log the phase so we can see every time it changes. This makes it easier to see that the phase of the action is changing like I had explained in the previous section, and if I only want the projectile to spawn once for each button press, I can check the phase in the code. Now it should only fire one projectile every time I press the spacebar. You could also check if the phase is cancelled if you want to fire when the button is released. Now we can move on to the behavior for the movement. I'll end up creating a couple of methods for this, since there will be some problems with only using one. I'm going to start with just the one to show you what happens. If I were to put the code to move the player in this method, the player only moves every time the input is changed. In the case of a button on the keyboard, this acts like a discrete movement, but you would get interesting results with something analog like the stick on a controller. 
Instead I'll just use this method to read the value from the input and pass that value to a move method that gets called every frame from the update method. I handle the look controls in a similar way, so I'll add those methods in really quick. The send message behavior is kind of similar, it just calls the send message method on the game object that has the player input component. To use this, you need to define methods with the same names shown in this box below the behavior option. Broadcast messages has similar behavior except that it sends the messages down to all the children of the game object as well. When I was using these message behaviors, I noticed that sometimes there was very noticeable input lag, so I don't know if it's the greatest option. The Wikipedia page defines a callback as any executable code that is passed as an argument to other code. That other code is expected to call back or execute the argument at a given time. You could also say a callback is a function that is passed as an argument to a parent function to be used at a later time. I found this really good blog about callback functions, so I'll leave a link in the description. Actions all have a started, performed, and cancelled callback, which correspond to the phases of the action. This means that when the action enters any of these phases, the corresponding callback gets triggered. These callback functions act like events, which means you can subscribe other functions to them. Each of the callbacks provides a callback context argument, just like when we were using the player input component to invoke events. Instead of using the player input component, you can also directly connect to an action and subscribe to the callbacks. I'm going to use the same action asset as I did before, so I'm going to add a public reference to it. And then I'll add references to the map and all the actions in the map. Now in the start method, I'll get access to the map and all the actions, making sure I get the names right. I'll also be sure to enable the gameplay map. All of the actions will have the same response as they did in the other examples, so I'm just going to copy the code from earlier. Now I'll subscribe the onFire method to the performed callback on the fire action. This argument is just a callback context, like I was using before, so I'll change the name to context so it's a little clearer. Now every time the fire action is performed, it will invoke the onFire method. I'm going to do the same thing for movement and rotation, but you'll notice a problem if I just subscribe to the performed callback. Since onMove and onLook are only subscribed to the performed method, Every time they get called, the value is going to be non-zero, so the code stores whatever the previous input is. One way of fixing this is to subscribe the onMove and onLook methods to the cancelled callbacks, that way when the input is released, the value is set to zero. 
We could also use the action triggered callback on the action map. This callback listens for state changes on any action within the action map. So instead of watching the performed and cancelled callbacks for the look and movement, I can create a method to read the value anytime the corresponding action changes. A third way of handling this is by just reading the value on the action every frame. The last callback is on action change, which listens globally for any change related to any action. Instead of a callback context, onActionChange provides an object and the action change. I'll log both of them so you can see what it looks like. Now that I've covered callback functions, it makes sense to talk about interactions, since interactions change the criteria to trigger callbacks. I'm just going to walk through all the predefined interactions so you can get an idea of when you would want to use them. More specifically, I'll talk about what triggers the performed callback. The press interaction is similar to the default behavior, but it allows you to select whether the performed callback is triggered when the button is pressed, released, or both. The tap interaction is a little more specialized since it only triggers a callback if the button is pressed and released within a short amount of time. So if I were to press and hold the fire button, nothing happens. The hold interaction is kind of the opposite of a tap. It doesn't trigger the callback until the button is held down for a set amount of time. So if I rapidly press the button, nothing happens in this case. Like the hold interaction, the slow tap interaction requires a player to hold down a button for a minimum amount of time, but it won't trigger the callback until a control is released. The multi-tap interaction requires a player to perform a specific number of taps with a short enough delay between them. It's similar to something like double-clicking, but you can change the required number of taps to anything you want. You can use the input settings to fine-tune these interactions, and there's buttons all over the place to open up the settings, and you can always find it in Edit, Project Settings, Input System Package. If you haven't already, you have to create a settings asset, otherwise the default settings are used. Additionally, it is possible to create your own interactions if you need to. That's a pretty quick rundown of everything in the input system.
Hopefully you learned something from this video, and if you have anything you want to add, be sure to put it in the comments. As always, be sure to hit the like button and subscribe. Thanks for watching.